Good afternoon and good morning. I'm Daniel Salter, the Head of Equity Strategy at Renaissance Capital. And this for me is the absolute dream panel to host at this event. It's the very highlight of this year's conference. We have here four of the best companies of modern Russia, all innovators from the very beginning, all innovators to their core and all continuing to innovate like crazy. For Russia to modernize and succeed as we all hope it will do, it is companies like these that will absolutely pave the way. We wanted to have for you today a mix across the sectors, so I'm delighted to introduce to you John Boynton, the chairman of Yandex, Oliver Hughes, the CEO of Tinkoff, Yelena Ivashentseva, the senior partner at Bering Vostok, and Svetlana Demyashkevich, uh, the CF CFO of X5. Welcome to the panel, everyone. In order Thank to you. minimize my yeah. talking today, I think we'll um, go straight into the action. And I want to really kick off by looking perhaps a little bit at the early stages so far of the recovery in the consumer and business activity in Russia. And starting off with Oliver, uh, what are you seeing in the rebound so far, both at Tinkoff and a bit more widely in the Russian economy? I, I was looking earlier at your Corona index. That's pretty cool. Um, what's it telling us? Do you think the trends are sustainable or is there some kind of element of initial excitement and deferred demand taking place as, as, as the economy begins to pick up? Sure. Hi, Daniel. Thanks. So um, you can look at the Tinkoff Corona Index on our site. Uh, basically, what we've done is taken all of the data across all of our different business lines. So this is um, Tinkoff business, the small and medium business, all of our consumer businesses on both sides, so the cards issuing side, payment side, the transactional side on the uh, merchant acquiring, we're a large merchant, uh, online merchant acquirer. Uh, and we've, we've compiled this, broken it down by uh, regions, different sectors, and basically tried to track the health of, of different sectors throughout the crisis, uh, obviously starting from basically the end of March. And uh, we update it weekly. So it's, it's a really good source based on our own real data. We've got a, a mass of customers. We've got 11 million customers in our ecosystem. So it's a pretty broad base. It gives you a very good view of what's going on. And we've uh, we come up with this index, this basically score, uh, which moves over time. So you can see uh, how it trends. And, uh, and you can see which, which regions are where in, uh, in their cycle uh, in terms of combating uh, COVID-19. So it's a useful resource. What are we seeing in our business? We're seeing that... Um, uh, we saw the drop basically at the end of March, um, as did everybody in Russia. It was a fairly sharp drop, but nowhere near as, uh, as deep as it could have been. Um, so we were mildly surprised on, on the good side as to, as to how shallow the drop was. Then it bottomed out quite quickly in the beginning of April and then began to gradually recover. And so right now, uh, basically as of last week, when we look at all of our transactional data and the turnover on our SME accounts, we're back up to pre-crisis levels in every single category. Uh, some categories were higher than uh, where we were before. So for example, online acquiring, as you'd expect, um, uh, that's, that's gone up. So we're, I think, 110, 115% of where we were before, with one exception. And the exception is obviously, obviously international purchases, uh, as you'd expect, that's uh, pretty, pretty depressed at the moment. It will be for a few months to come. So um, we're, we're surprised at how well this was handled how it's been staged. Obviously, Russia had the, the huge advantage of going into this later than other, other countries in Russia. Um, it's been fairly light in terms of lockdown. And also, the Russia's geography, I think, has, has helped as well. So different regions have gone into this at different stages. So we're obviously not out of the woods, um, but we're really quite optimistic, uh, uh, given what we see at the moment and, <clears throat> and the fact that everything has come back to normal again. So the question is, what happens now? <laughs> um, and when you look at transaction numbers across the world, and we look at visas numbers recently, um, you can see this uh, almost like elation, yeah, where people come out of lockdown fairly quickly within a two-week period and suddenly go out and spend. So you've got lots of um, uh, purchases which were postponed, um, social activity, restaurants, and whatever it is that people have been looking forward to doing, they go out and do it, and the transactions literally go up 150, 180% of the way they were before. So we'll see some of that for sure. Um, and then that'll calm down. And so the question is, where do we calm down, back down to? Um, I think we're looking more of a V-shaped situation. So they'll probably calm back, uh, back down to where there would have been more or less, maybe a little bit lower, had this not happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. But really for us, the big test is what's gonna happen in the autumn. You know, we're, we're still in a very cautious position. Um, we want to see how this plays itself out um, in the second half of the year, because you know, you can't have this kind of shock to the system that um, where everything just goes back to normal as if nothing had happened. There will be some fallout and we want to see what, what that looks like. 
Okay, thanks, Oliver. So good start, but a little bit of caution. I'm looking forward um, to see what happens in the in the autumn. Uh, Svetlana at X5. Uh, the retailers have had a, you know, fairly decent crisis in terms of 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 of, of demand, if you could put it that way. Um, but there is pressure on incomes. So where do we go from here? Um, are the customers again becoming more price sensitive and trading down? Um, is there some kind of regional trend that you're seeing? Are the big cities doing a bit better than the than the regions? Uh, perhaps where people are, are more able to work from home and thus maintain their incomes? What what are you seeing at the moment? Um, well, thank you for for the question. Uh, we had a very strong uh, first quarter and also April and May, and um, you know the revenue growth was uh, quite impressive, uh, uh, which is expected, I think, uh, from uh, the uh, proximity stores uh, first of all. And uh, we enjoyed you know you know this uh, period of high demand in our convenience uh, stores. Uh, at the moment, uh, we don't see any uh, trading down. Um, in contrary, I would see that uh, we do see trading up. So uh, people um, are not uh, having the opportunity uh, to go to the restaurants, uh, you know, to, and with the uh, horeca uh, mostly closed uh, during the lockdown period, uh, actually shifted uh, their consumption uh, into food retail. And uh, that actually benefited uh, the variety of goods uh, they're buying and, uh, you know, the, um, the variety of goods uh, in our basket. Uh, so, um, so far, even uh, for uh, our supermarkets and hypermarkets, uh, Perikrostok and Karusils, uh, we see uh, trading up rather than trading down. Um, at the same time, looking at the macro and, of course, thinking about, you know, what uh, we could expect uh, from the second half of the year, because I think uh, for everybody that's uh, the biggest question at the moment, uh, we see that, um, you know, the macro is not showing... Um, uh, some you know negative uh, scenario that we uh, were afraid of uh, in the end of March, for example. So we still see that uh, for April uh, nominal uh, wages uh, show <coughs> uh, of one percent, but you know at least growth and the income of population uh, decreased only by two three percent. And uh, some uh, of the even conservative analysts uh, forecast uh, that overall income of the population uh, for the year uh, will show um, around 5% um, uh, decrease. So uh, I think that for food retail, it's not that, that significant. Uh, and with the shift of consumption uh, from non-food to food that we see now already. So for example, uh, for the uh, average consumer, uh, we now see that 55% uh, are spent on food. Uh, coming from around 48% uh, that we had last year. Um, I think that, uh, you know, for food retail still, it's uh, quite a positive situation where we'll just see further shift of consumption from non-food to food. Uh, and of course, further shift uh, to proximity to a more mass segments uh, where we are uh, present and uh, being the leader, uh, you know, for us, of course, uh, it's quite a positive situation. <coughs> Thanks, Svetlana. If we shift the focus a little bit further forward now and look at maybe some of the longer term implications, um, I'd like to, to ask uh, John at Yandex. So companies have had to adjust to the new world, uh, some more so than others. What do you think sticks here and what is temporary? Do people just say this was a one in a hundred year event and uh, go back to normality? Um, probably not. But what are the most obvious, you know, some of the most obvious things are working from home that probably sticks around. But what other changes do we expect will really sustain or, or grow um, even as things get back uh, to normal, as we hope, in the, in the next six months or so? Uh, thanks for the question. I appreciate that. It, it, uh, good to be here in the conference. Um, I think we've seen, obviously, a lot of change. Um, I don't think uh, we ever would have imagined that people could have functioned as effectively at home as we're seeing them. Um, in the case of Yandex, um, over the course of three days, we went from having roughly 10,000 people in offices uh, to you know 99% of those people working at home. Um, so it was a, a dramatic shift. We were very concerned about how it might impact productivity and people's mindsets. And uh, so we, we did survey our folks every couple of weeks. And what's really interesting is that people found I think our numbers were 78% of our staff found that they were as productive or more productive working from home. So this idea that people can work from home in a distributed sense um, caught me a little bit by surprise. Um, and I was pleased to see it. I think that's going to impact the way that um, companies uh, you know, approach officing, uh, the way that uh, they approach travel. So I think uh, there'll be a lot of change that will persist. But uh, more broadly, I think that what COVID has done uh, with regard to the economy is it's accelerating a lot of the trends we were already seeing. So businesses that digitized 
and that have been in that process, I think will come out ahead. Businesses that have been slow to digitize are going to have a harder time going forward. And um, what we've seen over the last several years, um, and you take uh, transportation as an example, is um, a lot of um, the uh, the way that people conduct their basic business um, has changed. In the old days, you know, you hailed a taxi. Now it's all done through an app. In the old days, you went to a grocery store. I think going forward, uh, we're going to see more and more of that. Um, with regard to our own ride hailing in, in each businesses, um, we are seeing strong pickups there. It was interesting to watch, um, you know, as people were forced to stay home, uh, dramatic increases in the way that they use technology to, to, to bring food to them. And so I think that um, at the end of the day, COVID-19 will be a big accelerator for a lot of the trends that we've been seeing for some time. And, uh, and again, will force many of the traditional industries to figure out how to digitize themselves to make sure that they don't, they don't get left behind in that process. Thank you. And Oliver Tinkoff, similar, similar thoughts or anything you'd add to that? Oh, yeah. I'll just add that uh, um, Yandex and ourselves were basically a day or two apart in terms of moving all of our staff to cloud. We got a similar number. So we had 12,000 people in various offices uh, across Russia, and most of them in Moscow. And uh, within a week, everybody was in home working. I'm a somewhat old school um, in terms of my pre-COVID beliefs um, in terms of home working. Uh, and I was totally um, bowled over in a positive way by how um, communications continued, intensified. <laughs> Our creativity levels have actually increased. Uh, we're rolling out new products and features like we've never done before. We were all, 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 always pretty good at that. Um, and, uh, and productivity, so efficiency and productivity, just all of the usual measures um, are all holding up very well indeed. Um, so so it, basically this has proven to us that this is viable, uh, where we had some, some um, question marks before, maybe some doubts, and, uh, and we weren't um, prepared to, uh, to basically conduct a mass experiment on the whole workforce and disrupt service and, and business and all the rest of it. It's happened. We were forced to do it. And nothing broke and it's worked really really well and actually we've actually got lots of pluses out of this so we'll never return to the office in the same way the office will become what we call a culture, a palace of culture it's a place to meet to create to exchange information not where you go for eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or whatever it is in our case 15 hours a day to, to work uh, so it's going to be a very different world in terms of work practice for sure so we should short commercial real estate i i guess is the conclusion from 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 that mm -hmm. Okay, um, Svetlana, X5, I mean, we've clearly seen the acceleration and the shift to more online services, but have you noticed any other perhaps surprising changes to consumer habits in the last three months or so? Uh, yeah, you're right. Probably the biggest change for us was the pace uh, uh, with what our online sales were growing. And uh, apart from Perikrostok uh, Online, uh, which was uh, there for two years and was already popular with our customers, we were able uh, to start um, express delivery from our stores. Uh, uh, and um, starting almost from zero in February, uh, we reached uh, more than 11,000 uh, orders per day. Uh, in May, and uh, we're also able to open it already in several cities uh, in Russia. So that's a, a big change for us. And of course, uh, we uh, will be excited to see how it develops further uh, into the year and, um, you know, <laughs> longer term um, after the lockdown is, uh, is lifted. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting to see how this business will uh, develop and grow in Russia. Uh, apart from that, uh, we were quite uh, actually surprised um, uh, about the behavior of customers uh, in regards uh, of uh, fresh products. Uh, um, we only had um, two, three weeks uh, of uh, rush demand where people were mostly um, uh, uh, mostly focused uh, on the products with longer shelf, shelf lives. Uh, but then, uh, you know, they um, returned uh, to uh, fresh fruits, um, vegetables, meat, uh, etc. So um, we see also that um, after the decline uh, in category of ready to eat that we saw uh, in March and April, now starting from May, June, uh, it's uh, back uh, on track, uh, both in Perikrosta and Pityorichka, and uh, people are starting, you know, to uh, pick up with this trend of increasing uh, ready to eat. So that's also a nice um, change for us uh, uh, because, uh, you know, ready to eat and fresh products uh, is, uh, you know, 
one of the core elements of our new strategy uh, in Perekrosta uh, Kompetorichka, and uh, we do put focus on that. So uh, I think uh, we'll be uh, here uh, back, uh, you know, on, on this track. I certainly, I certainly think there are a lot of people in the in the UK and probably in Russia as well who've got uh, pantries full up with pasta and tinned goods at the moment that they panic bought at the beginning of this crisis, thinking that the food would run out. Did you imagine that? Oh. <laughs> and I had a special arrangement with our head of uh, Perekrostok online, uh -huh. <laughs> no, just to keep some, uh, you know, uh, some um, some buffer for top management. You're just a good person case. to know in and the next still, project. You know, I still have a full pantry. <laughs> Very good. Um, maybe moving on to the sort of the investment side. Um, Yelena, um, what, what do you consider at the moment to be the most sort of exciting segments within the tech world to be looking at at the moment? And has that changed at all during the, during this crisis? Um, has it brought some opportunities for the companies you're looking at, perhaps? Um, are some of them now perhaps closer to IPO than they were before? Or has it kind of pushed back the agenda on the on the IPO timeline? First of, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. We have, I have two great friends and two former portfolio companies on the, on the panel. Uh, and uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, in terms of um, you know, what has changed and what trends we're seeing, uh, first of all, we are a long-term investor. So we focus and we try to predict uh, the long-term circular trends. And uh, actually, um, um, many, if not most, of our portfolio companies have actually benefited from the lockdown. And uh, for some of them, we, we think that uh, the benefit and the acceleration has been, uh, you know, it, it is not likely to be fully sustainable. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, online services that are you know, uh, somewhat entertainment like EV. Um, uh, online video and retress uh, electronic books. Obviously, people had a lot of time and they were spending the time buying um, and, and uh, the, you know, looking for various uh, entertainment ways on, uh, to spend online. Uh, some of this will go uh, obviously down, uh, but there will be uh, some advantages that uh, even such companies will, uh, will sustain. And, and then, um, you know, this uh, last several weeks have been so concentrated and it feels like for some of our businesses, we've lived through a couple of years and not, you know, uh, three, um, you know, two or three months because uh, the acceleration with which, for example, you know, people starting shifted, uh, started shifting uh, to online e-commerce uh, has been pretty amazing. Uh, we've seen with Ozone, we've seen the uh, percentage of uh, marketplace uh, third-party goods uh, uh, exceed 50%, which we didn't expect by the end of 2020. And uh, so the demand was obviously you know, pretty amazing. And uh, both we expect that both the customers and obviously the merchants uh, will stay and the habit will continue um, after this. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lexi Plana mentioned for X5, we have Kusville, uh, which is proximity food retail. They went from essentially like a thousand orders per day to thirty thousand orders per day in delivery, uh, and uh, no one really expected this trend. And you know, the company is obviously very much focused on uh, developing and building this business uh, right now. And so there are lots of uh, pretty exciting businesses, both on the you know the consumer uh, services side, which uh, you know are are growing and are benefiting, but also on the um, uh, on the uh, uh, on the online um, and mobile uh, services side, we have uh, interesting software companies that are also benefiting. FinTech companies, obviously, the payments have gone to online you know, very, very immediately, and uh, uh, and so this is it's a very exciting time for this kind of long term trends. And obviously, we are thinking about which which uh, which trends will accelerate, which trends will. Uh, will uh, will uh, come back over the next several months, but uh, but it's pretty amazing. I have to say, uh, you know, um, that one uh, other trend that we noticed in this crisis has been the communication with the government, uh, mm -hmm. because in the previous crisis, uh, we actually you know the, the the businesses were on their own, uh, you know, solving their problems and deciding and trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to survive. This time we actually had pretty good communication across the portfolio with uh, the government, uh, both with businesses uh, launching um, uh, launching the production of necessary goods such as antiseptics and uh, um, and the masks, but also 
just kind of uh, agreeing with the government to remove unnecessary regulation uh, and doing it quickly. So it's been it's been pretty positive. And uh, our you know, big concern over the years has been uh, this kind of distrust of the government in the private business. They definitely the trend is uh, both from the population, but also the government is to to trust the state-owned companies and to trust the you know the, the power much more and um, um, and uh, and what we hope is actually now is a good time to uh, to kind of to build on this trust and try to resolve some of the problems and tensions that still exist between the businesses and uh, uh, and the power and uh, in our case we we certainly believe that um, now is an excellent time to uh, to finally kind of stop this civil war that we have between law enforcement and uh, and uh, the businesses um, uh, we have uh, this uh, case with a criminal case related to bank vastochny uh, where you know four of my colleagues and two portfolio companies managers uh, have been uh, detained for a year and a half, and it's clear that the charges have been, you know, you know totally fabricated. There is no proof of uh, uh, any serious wrongdoing, and uh, but at the same time, uh, the case uh, continues for a year and a half. It's been extremely damaging for the business environment, for the investment climate, and uh, I think now with kind of this better uh, communication and better understanding. Uh, uh, that we need to solve problems together. I, I, I certainly hope that uh, uh, the case will be resolved sooner rather than later. And I think it's very important because, uh, like uh, this theme of the panel, is that how do we, uh, um, you know, how can Russia move beyond, you know, the extractive industries to more entrepreneurial companies, the co companies such as we have on the, on the panel. And if you think about this over the last uh, ten years. Uh, Russian GDP has the growth in Russian GDP has not once exceeded five percent, uh, but the companies so in our portfolio, portfolio, the likes of the companies we have on, on the panel, have been growing consistently by 25, 40 percent more uh, in many cases. And we need more of these companies, and we need more of these businesses, and we need the private investment coming to to support the entrepreneurs. And I certainly hope this will uh, this will happen faster. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's obviously you know good news that the government is supporting industries more during this crisis, and and that, let's hope that that extends further into the investment climate. Um, moving on now a bit into into maybe looking at some of the second round effects, not not the sort of direct impact of, of the COVID um, uh, pandemic, but you know what 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 could be some of the impacts longer term. And I think one one interesting thing is this idea about whether we're now entering a very long period of ultra low interest rates, not just in the developed world, which we had since for the last decade, but perhaps also moving into some of the emerging markets, perhaps including Russia. Um, Oliver, what do you think? Do you think we we could be heading into such a world where ultra low rates um, are, are, are spreading globally? Are you starting to model, model for this in, at Tinkoff? What do you think that could mean for lending, consumption, your business? What are your thoughts there? We, we don't model in that way, to be honest with you. We're mm -hmm. very very much a bottom-up model uh, kind of company. Um, but it could well be that we're in, so we're in the lowest interest rate environment that we've ever had in Russia. So the, the, the key rate has just been reduced by the central bank to, to 4%, and it could go down more uh, based on the signals that everybody's receiving. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> there's obviously some benefits to this in terms of cost of borrowing coming down and maybe... Um, consumer lending can continuing after the, the COVID crisis to be at one of the drives of the economy, uh, of economic growth. Um, but basically, I think I'd like to answer this question not from a macro perspective, because that's not my strong point. Um, there's lots of people I'm sure been talking about all morning, but from a micro perspective, yeah, so what does this actually mean in terms of uh, basically a retail and small business financial service provider like Tinkoff? So, um, this, this affects us in a number of different ways. So deposit rates coming down, fine, but people are still depositing. Uh, but they're also looking um, to apply basically a sort of portfolio approach. So three, four years ago, uh, the, the idea of a, a broker a brokerage account and investments was the domain of the super rich, and there was basically less than half a million, maybe even much less than half a million, active brokerage accounts in Russia. And if you had any money, you kept it offshore. And if you had any money in Russia, then you didn't really do much with it. 
Um, and there was no capital markets, there was no retail investment. And as we see in many other places across the world, um, retail investments is one of the one of the drivers of, of, of capital markets and, uh, and the economy in general, as we saw with the, the recovery, the rebound, which is probably retail led in, the, in many um, equity stories over the last few months. Yeah. So they kept it buoyant. In Russia, over the last two, two and a half years, has been a revolution. Um, and this has been driven by Tinkoff, uh, Tinkoff investments to our mobile app and then other players followed. Uh, it's good that there's not just one player doing this. So if you think <coughs> of Hood, Robin Hood in Russia, uh, we've got a kind of Robin Hood only better in, in, inside our ecosystem, which is mobile investment uh, through a mobile app. And uh, um, we've already got almost two and a half million uh, bro retail brokerage customers, and we're onboarding tons and tons more. So what's this done? What this has done is um, uh, brought in lots of retail, let's say mass retail, mass affluent investors, and then going you know higher up pecking order as well in terms of uh, balances. Um, made investing accessible uh, and actually brought new money into the market. So you get people buying bonds, you get them buying stocks, not just in Russian stories, but internationally, but Russian stories as well. So our, our um, uh, stocks trade on the Moscow exchange as well as the London Stock Exchange. Um, and a lot of our liquidity is coming from retail investors, including our own retail investors, actually 20% on a daily basis, which is amazing. Nobody could have thought this a year or two, year or two ago. Uh, and it's growing by the day. So um, the low rate environment um, overlaid on uh, on top of, if you like, technology and availability means that people are going to be doing more and more investing in, into the economy, which is providing capital, which is one of the levers of, levers of growth of the Russian economy. So that's, that's a, a good uh, positive benefit of a, a low interest rate environment, which, uh, which I think will continue. On the lending side, uh, consumer lending, um, Obviously, there's it's a bit of a, a, a curious egg story. So it's good in parts because you've basically got two Russians to oversimplify it. You've got the more mass affluent Russia, um, urban, uh, more mobile in all sense of the word, consuming and spending, and you know, there's growth, income growth, and, and uh, growth in consumption. And then you've got your poorer, probably less urban Russia in more uh, depressed economic areas, whose incomes haven't been growing over the last few years. Um, the so the, the, the lending piece is actually quite sensitive and you have to talk about, you know, look at which segments of the, uh, of the population different lenders are working in. And, uh, and the central bank has been very keen to protect um, those parts of the population whose incomes haven't been growing, whose leverage has been growing. Uh, so, so the fact that we're in a, a slower loan growth environment due to regulatory pressure, which has been building up over the last few years for good reasons, um, as well as you know, some, let's say, dislocations that have happened recently, means you're going to get a, a lower lending pace of growth in, the, in those sectors that can't support that growth. So that's good. Um, and then I think probably the, the market can sustain 10, 15%. But the structure of that lending has changed a lot as well over the last few years. So it's now over two thirds secured lending as opposed to two, the two thirds unsecured lending that it was in previous years, which caused problems. It caused the first credit cycle. In 2014. So it's difficult to answer your question in terms of how it's going to pan itself out from here, but I can see some positive benefits from this as well. Oh, thank you. Um, John, moving over to Yandex. Um, is cheap capital good for Yandex? I guess so. You raised a billion dollars yesterday. Congratulations <laughs> um, for doing that. Um, I, I guess you know, cheap capital should be good for innovation generally, globally, and within Russia. But are there some negatives? Is it is it going to prevent the con kind of consolidation that we all expect to happen eventually, where some of the weaker players <laughs> run out of money, um, and maybe they can sustain themselves for, for a bit longer with with, with cheap, abundant um, funding? What, do, what are your thoughts here? Um, well, I think you know, net net cheap capital is good for technology and innovation. Um, what we have seen is that I mean, the, the first half of this year, I've been personally surprised by the fact that the capital markets have remained open, and companies have come have continued to come back, and the markets have uh, have responded. And I think you know, you talked about at the beginning of the question about you know a lower interest rate environment that may be in place for years to come. The um, you know when you have an environment like that the uh, dollars seek higher returns. And so they turn to equity. And I think that technology is clearly an area where investors see a lot, a lot of opportunity. When you layer on top of that, the emerging markets aspect of Russia, uh, people are excited about Russia. So as you said, uh, we raised a billion dollars yesterday uh, that was associated with 
a deal we announced yesterday where we are buying back um, 45% ownership of our Yandex market business that two years ago was set up as a joint venture with Verbank. Bought that back um, and we brought in some, some, uh, some additional investors as well. And the deal was significantly oversubscribed. And again, it, what it says to me is that investors are excited about Russia. Um, I think that as Elena said, um, there's been uh, good collaboration between the government and business uh, over the past several months. Uh, having that kind of stability and that kind of um, kind of giving the confidence to investors that things are going to remain on track, that the government will be supportive of business is important. I think also that um, that that the trust that investors are developing with the companies on this panel uh, and others is is a significant piece of it too. I think that over the last twenty years, we've seen um, Russian companies become significantly better governed than they were um, in the uh, last decade of the prior century. So. Um, that's been a factor too, but uh, to the question as to you know whether cheap capital allows weak players to hang around longer, um, maybe that's true. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what 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 low cost low cost capital really means is that more direct investment will flow into those businesses, more innovation can happen, and a lot of the innovation happens at the smaller end of the market, small companies, small teams with big ideas, and um, and if they have better access to capital, I think that's a good thing. Um, and so uh, we're excited to do what we can to help uh, make investments ourselves at the in the market and these these young companies. But um, you know, I, I think that we could be on the verge of a of a of a, of a renaissance in in uh, you know small business uh, high growth uh, made possible by this uh, this low cost capital. Good. Um, I'd li like to look and um, move move a bit to the sort of the fraying edges or the merging that we're seeing between online and offline. You know, is is that now sort of an artificial segmentation of the the market? And this is uh, for Svetlana really. You know, the the, the boundaries here are becoming very blurred. Uh, retailers are moving into online and big data. Uh, the internet companies like Yandex are now present in online grocery retail, taxis, and food deliveries. Uh, the banks are all pretty much online by now. Uh, Sparebank has talked about uh, looking potentially at Ozon. Um, I could even get my hair cut using Tinkoff's super app. Um, will all this uh, overlap continue to, to increase? I mean, what does it mean? Does it mean that we're going to see um, uh, companies from different sectors suddenly competing against each other? Um, that you know, the, that you know, if you're X5 as a retailer, you could do anything. Why, 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 why stop at food retailing? Should you, should you focus or should companies just do, do anything they want to now? Um, is, is, is the solution more partnerships, more M&A? Um, what do you think about this at, at X5? Um, well, I, I would agree with you that uh, the um, you know the, the difference between the industry is blurring, and we do see uh, strong players uh, from different sectors uh, um, you know going through these uh, boundaries, uh, and uh, tech companies coming into physical world, and vice versa, traditional players uh, coming into online. And uh, for us, for example, um, uh, we are of course coming from our core uh, from food. Uh, but we already see that uh, you know that these boundaries are disappearing. Uh, for example, we already consider uh, that uh, um, food market, uh, you know, food uh, sector and uh, restaurants, for example, uh, already form uh, just food retail and, and restaurants already form just one sector, as we call it, food. And uh, uh, customer doesn't care, uh, you know, in what form and how it's uh, delivered. Svetlana may have been cut off in her prime. Let's give her two or three seconds, see if she rejoins us. Well, John, I think you're still... Svetlana, are you still there? I think we had a little technical um, commercial break there for a few seconds. Are, are you able to rewind by about 10 seconds? Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Let me just. Okay, so I guess I, I can just, uh, yeah, and you can see me now already. Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, um, 
I was talking about, uh, you know, uh, blurring the boundaries between uh, food retail and restaurants. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's important uh, what customer needs. Uh, so we can uh, deliver uh, ready to eat uh, food from the restaurants or, uh, you know, the person could uh, go to the uh, store and uh, cook at uh, home. Uh, and, uh, you know, also uh, the, the uh, um, the delivery uh, methods uh, should be very different. Uh, and uh, the players uh, that participate in this market are also very different, coming uh, from you know, banks uh, to uh, food retail, uh, to uh, tech companies, etc. So it's uh, more um, uh, about uh, the customer path and uh, customer centric. And I think that more and more traditional companies are also coming uh, to this concept. It was traditionally um, and traditional for online companies, I mean, for tech companies, uh, but traditional companies also had to go through this uh, uh, path uh, and understand, you know, uh, how um, the uh, customer uh, path uh, works uh, for our clients and how to cover all the needs. At the same time, of course, uh, it's uh, very individual for each company uh, what way to choose uh, whether to diversify into uh, segments which are um, uh, which are uh, further, you know, from the core. So, for example, it's always uh, for us. It's always a choice, you know, how far uh, we should and uh, we could go uh, from food, uh, and uh, we are taking this quite carefully. At the same time, when we do see this opportunity and we understand that we can build this uh, new business uh, based on our infrastructure, on our competitive advantages, and we do have proper team in place and resources, uh, we are going for it. At the same time, uh, we already see that um, uh, the competition is changing a lot and more and more traditional players are following the same direction. So for us, uh, this uh, you know, online world uh, is just the uh, extension of our physical world. So it's just an extension of CVP of our formats. Uh, our formats are truly omnichannel and uh, they should provide and you know, uh, should be able to provide the services uh, to their customers. So that's uh, the recent state. At the same time, I think that um, uh, the market uh, e-grocery, I'm talking about e-grocery here, is still very small. And I think there is a space uh, for development for many uh, strong players uh, and um, with this ambition and uh, um, liquidity and investments uh, that, uh, that we have uh, at the market, I think uh, we will be just uh, developing uh, this uh, share of the market uh, in online, this new uh, proposition for our customers. And it's uh, just too early uh, to, um, um, you know, to specify who will be the winner and, uh, you know, how the market uh, finally will be shaped. It's just uh, an early stage of it. I think there is a space for all of us uh, to grow there and to provide the best uh, proposition for the customers. Thanks, Svetlana. Um, uh, over to John. I mean, how, how, how are you looking at this? Um, you know, the sort of merger for, of online to offline and, you know, how do, how do companies solve this? Do they, do partnerships work? Um, you've obviously been, been in one recently. Um, is it more about M&A? Um, how are you looking at it? It's, it's a good question. I think that traditionally, um, um, many of us thought of, we had, a, had the core traditional businesses and then online was like a channel to the customer, right? What we're seeing is, is, that, is that online is much more than a channel. And a lot of the companies that were traditionally purely online companies have found that they can actually get into these traditional businesses themselves. So this theme of convergence, I think is gonna to continue to, to accelerate. Um, you know, Yandex talks about its goal being to help customers, help consumers better navigate the online and the offline world. So we are seeing these things come together. And uh, you know, we think more and more of, of, of ourselves as an ecosystem. You know, once a customer comes in and uh, and experiences one service, they're able to access a whole bunch of other services. And this has enabled us to move from, you know, core search into a whole bunch of other verticals. And I think that this is what we're going to see. I mean, we've seen uh, large ecosystems emerge in the West. Uh, we're seeing them uh, build up in different markets around the world. And it's really a matter of convenience for consumers. If you can have, you know, your data, you know, with one company, uh, you can actually uh, derive more value from your interactions with that company. So um, <clears throat> we're very much focused on this. I think the question of partnerships and um, you know how one ties into the ecosystem is really an important question. Um, there will be companies that will not be equipped to tie into these ecosystems. Uh, so take um, you know online advertising or e-commerce as an example. Um, if you don't have your business digitized in a way that allows you to connect with an ecosystem, 
it's going to be very hard to get your products to market. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an area where companies are going to have to invest. Um, and I think we'll see additional um, partnering going on. Um, at the same time, you know, one of the reasons that we decided to reconsolidate Yandex market is that we realized we needed more flexibility to move pieces around. That by integrating assets, you can provide a much richer experience to the consumer. And if you don't have control of those assets, it makes it more difficult um, to deliver that, that, that robust experience that you want to deliver. So I think that there will be, we will certainly see partnerships continue because companies will have to partner to tie into the ecosystems. But I also think we'll see <clears throat> you know, companies wanting to have control over uh, you know, the, the, the full span of their ecosystems because that is really the only way uh, to uh, have the flexibility and the opportunity to, 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 to shift and to, and to optimize as the businesses continue to grow. Thank you very much. Um, I want to have a look, um, Oliver, at um, how, you know, how do we deal with this sort of need to shift the entire economy pretty much online? Is, is there enough talent in Russia to do this? I mean, people always talk about the brain drain and stuff. In my experience, hiring analysts, um, I find no shortage of amazing talent in, in Russia. So I'm interested in what you're thinking now. Have you noticed some kind of acceleration of, you know, of competition as everyone, both within Russia and outside of Russia, is looking for IT developers to, to take their businesses on, online? Or are you still finding that you're able to secure that talent and develop it um, from within your company? Sure. So uh, this question of, uh, of, let's say, the brain drain, I would put it quite differently, uh, in a slightly different way, um, competition against dollar salaries. <laughs> it was written large in, uh, in 2014, 2015, especially after the devaluation, we all remember, uh, with, with shivers down our spine, yeah, at the end of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was difficult, um, a difficult period, and at the same time, um, spread tiach, uh, came onto the market and started hoovering up IT uh, specialists all over the place. But um, to be honest with you, since then it's got a bit easier. So so we have a huge uh, luxury, let's put it that way, in Russia of, of sitting on top of the best tech talent in the world. So there's plenty of it to go around, um, but it's quite a hot market. Uh, so you have to um, have the right brand to attract those guys as, a, as a, an employer. You have to have the right environment to uh, retain and motivate those that, that tech talent. When I'm talking about tech talent, I'm not, I'm not just talking about uh, engineers. I'm talking about designers, analysts, data scientists, you know, the, the full Monty. Um, all, all, all of the um, intellectual uh, capacity, all of the intellectual capital that you need to build a proper tech company. Um, and build the ecosystem that uh, John just very eloquently described. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, that there's there's a lot of competition for these guys locally between all the tech companies and, and companies with uh, with um, with ambitions to become more digital, let's say. Uh, but but we have uh, an excellent education system here, uh, excellent infrastructure, if you like, and so there's, there's plenty of guys to take. And it's not like you know we're hiring guys, training guys um, uh, at a young age, and these tech specialists are all going off Silicon Valley. Uh, so. There are elements of that sometimes, and, and it always gets worse when, when the ruble weakens, but it's not a big big issue at the moment. So the issue is really um, probably a level down, um, If again, putting my kind of financial hat on here. Um, if you're a bank, you're basically a, a, an employer that tech specialists, tech talent doesn't want to go and work for. It's a harsh fact of life that tech specialists don't want to work in banks. It's just not very cool, um, even if they pay well. So there has to be a lot more going on inside that financial institution and all the stuff around it um, for, for it to be interesting, um, aspirational, and a place that you want to work and spend time and, and, uh, and all the rest of it as a, as a young tech talent, or even not so young tech talent. Um, and so if you're a bank, you're just going to be cut out of this. You're toast over time if you haven't got you know the wherewithal to to, to offer and attract these guys because um, you're you're competing with some of the guys on this panel and uh, and guys not on this panel and guys outside of, of Russia who are pretty stiff competition um, so so it's going to hot up um, the further we go the more some sort of the larger institution of digitize uh, but we have the best tech talent here. and and there's more of it coming up and uh, if you know how to find it you can uh, continue to uh, 
to, to grow your business um, by recruiting those guys. So, so it's, it's, it's not uh, a showstopper, let's put it that way. It can be done. Okay, so long as you're best of the best, you can do it, which you are. Um, Elena, what, what do you think? We talked about how the government is, is supporting businesses a bit better in Russia now, but what, what in general do you think when you look at Russia versus some of the other emerging markets as, as some of the sort of key reasons to invest in Russia? Is it the talent of the, of the workforce? Or what, 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 do you, what are you seeing as the, some of the main advantages um, investing in the sector within Russia? So obviously, um, as you know, this panel shows, uh, we have three companies that didn't exist, uh, whatever, 20 years ago, and now uh, they are multi-billion, very multi-billion dollar in your market cap, uh, very successful companies. Uh, and uh, the, it shows what Russia is capable of, and uh, what we love about the market is uh, the combination of uh, unique uh, entrepreneurial talent, and they are very creative, very strong entrepreneurs. Uh, that are you know, capable to solve all sorts of problems and challenges, which we always have a lot of. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the combination of the entrepreneurial talent with, uh, uh, with excellent uh, IT talent, as Oliver described. Russia does indeed have you know, great education in math and physics and uh, software. Uh, if you look at whatever statistics in terms of uh, uh, the number of uh, you know, graduates with STEM degrees in Russia in proportion to overall university graduates, it's highest in across all of the countries. Uh, so it's, uh, if you look at, uh, there's a famous uh, student uh, contest uh, in programming. Uh, Russia is by far number one for many, many years. And, uh, and uh, the talent is definitely there. And there's also this network effect when uh, you have, you know, some, uh, you know, some guys who, you know, uh, you know, many years ago built Yandex, became uh, uh, multi uh, multi millionaires uh, or billionaires, and uh, so the younger generation looks at them, and uh, they get much more interested to start their own business in IT and develop it. Uh, so for us, it's a unique opportunity to find the next Yandex to, you know, uh, help finance the next Tinkoff and. Uh, uh, and uh, if you look at, at Russia versus other emerging markets, uh, uh, there are um, uh, there are only three countries in the world where uh, the you know uh, majority of the top mobile applications and top online uh, sites are actually uh, you know are actually dominated by domestic champions. These are U.S. obviously because these are global companies, uh, China because China is closed for many global players. In Russia, in Russia, I mean, there is you know, global companies can compete freely, uh, but at the same time, we still have uh, you know the, the best uh, uh, like you know uh, Tinkoff and uh, many of the Yandex applications are in the top ten. And uh, it's just if you if you look at Germany, if you, if you look at the UK, the, the story will be very different. So it's not just the emerging markets, but but also just kind of the the sheer ability of the entrepreneurs and. Uh, uh, they, the uh, the availability of a great IT talent. Uh, we, we have great companies, and we also have great services for the consumer. You know, if you 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 look and compare, for example, you know, online banking in Europe compared to it with Russia, you'll be disappointed uh, how bad Europe is. And uh, uh, and uh, and what the, the trend we're also seeing that we're also looking more actively at is uh, some of the kind of Russian IT, IT entrepreneurs are going either from Russia or are going to other markets and starting global companies. Mm -hmm. But they rely on development and they rely on engineering talent uh, in the country. And John knows how many times, how much time we spent in Yandex uh, looking to conquer a global market. Uh, but for Yandex, obviously, Russia is such, a, uh, such an important and uh, unique market. It doesn't really make sense. But there's Revolut with Staronsky, that's, a, that's all kind of a uh, FISTEC graduate. Uh, uh, there are some couple of former colleagues of Oliver are starting an, an online bank in, uh, in, in Europe. So this we're also seeing this trend more and more, and we are seeing uh, local IT talent you know, competing successfully in the global market. So we're extremely excited. We believe that there will be more companies uh, such as Tinkoff and, uh, and Yandex, and uh, we need more of them. Thanks, Elena. I, th I think this idea about sort of homegrown national champions, best in class companies also applies to the retail sector um, in, in, in Russia. Um, Elena, as a, as a curator, if, if you like, of, of some of the strongest brands in Russia, 
do you do you worry about the value of brands now? You know, I'm talking about things like you know Zoom, which suddenly grew from 10 million daily participants in December to 300 million in April. You know, not that many people had heard of it three months ago. Now everyone assumes it's a uh, you know the leading brand in 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 communications. We're using it at the moment as the backbone for this for this for this conference. Quite astonishingly, quite asto- quite astonishing. But you know, do you, do you do you think the value of, of a brand is becoming under threat with what we're seeing at the moment globally, or do you think it's it's a it's a, a vital part of, of running a business, in, at least in your sector? No, it's definitely value. You know, a very important part of running any business. And you know, this you know, three businesses on the on the panel have amazing brands again that that develop that have been developed over um, over not many years. And uh, what we see is actually the, uh, the the brand is developing and changing. There are lots of kind of mid market brands. Uh, that are disappearing. Um, uh, that you know, f- you used to switch on TV and you you'll be bombarded with lots of whatever shampoo brands and cleaning brands and whatever whatever not. Now you, you essentially you have uh, it's it's kind of becoming more much more extreme. So you have several very strong consumer brands, consumer product brands, such as Apple, for example, mm-hmm. and then you have. Uh, a very strong uh, uh, development of this uh, marketplace platform brands, and that's also unique. And uh, the value of the platform brands is uh, is so is so significant. And uh, so for us, uh, we are looking for these investments because if you find one, you uh, actually can make uh, make it a very successful you know uh, company and a very successful brand. Uh, for example, you take Avita. Avita didn't exist, whatever, as a brand uh, 15 years ago. And now it's uh, you know everybody knows it, every family uses it, and it was uh, created over several years as a as a basically marketplace uh, platform brand. I think what 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 has changed what the, all of the companies understand and what we appreciate is the communication with the customer has changed. So. It used to be that you had, you know, carpet advertising, and so only companies which uh, have big scale, big money, such as Procter and Gamble, Unilever, and the likes, they could afford this advertising, and the likes of Yandex and Tinko couldn't. But uh, now we have a much more personalized, personalized communication, much more targeted communication, and you can find the customer, and uh, and, and this is this creates an opportunity <coughs> for a totally new brand, for a totally new. Uh, value that the platform marketplace or even a consumer company, a retail company, can give to their customers. So uh, I know Perkos does the same, but Kusil has an excellent uh, um, app uh, talking to the consumer and getting you know, tens of thousands of you know, feedback, uh, uh, kind of messages from uh, from the customers every day on the quality of the product. They there's kind of basically continuing. Um, yeah, education containing feedback loop, which never existed. So I think it's a, just a new world and a new definition of the brand. But uh, it's it's a much better, uh, you know, much more valuable brand than it used to be. Svetlana, how do you see it at X5? Do you how do, how do you maintain the value of your brand against such sort of up, such fast upstarts, which can very very quickly gain market market share in in different segments? Do you try to launch new brands, or do you try to focus the attention on your existing brands? Um, well, I would agree here that the feedback from customers is very important and focusing on the uh, concrete, uh, you know, feedback uh, uh, allows us even, you know, to change some elements in our assortment. And that's what we, you know, partly copied proudly from Kusvil also. Uh, I think it's really a good practice uh, to focus for Russian retailers to focus more on uh, this, you know, massive feedback. And we also have all kinds of platforms now and developing very quickly in this uh, direction, uh, to, uh, even changing the assortment on the shelves uh, uh, based on this feedback. That's also already true uh, for our <coughs> Uh, we're also developing uh, our private label uh, based on, uh, again, uh, understanding of what uh, customer needs uh, and wants. Uh, and uh, that, um, I would say, decreases um, the value of um, uh, big FMCG brands uh, because um, most of the big players, including uh, big food retailers, uh, can uh, create uh, this um, uh, new private label uh, brands, uh, which are uh, of the same quality and of the same 
um, you know, um, design and the level of design and uh, level of uh, convenience uh, for the customer depending on, on the product. So um, using our knowledge about the customer, and of course we have uh, huge amounts of data and started uh, luckily to use it at some point. So we created our uh, big data department uh, only two years ago, of course, uh, compared to our uh, tech, <laughs> uh, you know, compared to the uh, tech companies or banks, uh, it's quite late. But uh, in food retail, of course, uh, it's, uh, I think, of course, we have a huge competitive advantage at the moment uh, to be able to use this data on our client uh, to create a proper uh, customer value management. And uh, that's probably the big direction uh, which will be moving our brand forward and increasing the value of, uh, of our uh, retail brands. Thanks, Svetlana. I want to sort of move, move, move the concept of brands on, onto this idea of kind of umbrella companies and and drawing into the this the idea of you know what should a company be doing so you know it's a, it's a question to start off uh, for john at yandex um you know, clearly you know companies like yandex and mail and tinkoff have very different brand strategies at yandex you've got everything more or less branded as yandex at tinkoff um tinkoff is the brand but you have various sub brands in in the investment supermarket or companies which are selling into the investment supermarket um, and then mail has its own separate brands um, un under its umbrella, which are, which are segmented. You might not know they were part of, part of Mail. What, what do you think about that? Do you, do you think being a kind of umbrella company with multiple products is the way forward? Um, what are the pros and cons here? Is it better to use one brand or multiple brands? Um, is there a risk actually down the line that we end up with a lot of kind of holding companies or conglomerates, which um, over the last decade or so have been seen as the kind of the wrong business model in, 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 in much of the world? Um, so John, for you first, then we'll ask Oliver. You know, I, I think that the answer is going to vary by company. Uh, for us, clearly, it has worked to brand everything Yandex. So almost everything we do is known as Yandex dot whatever the service is. And that's worked really, really effectively for us. I think that's going to be different. That may be different for Tinkoff, maybe different for X5. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a uh, different company to the company. Um, but I think that uh, the really the, the core question is whether you can provide a really rich consumer experience, um, you know, across your brands. And so that's what we try to do. We try to provide consistency. We try to provide best in class services. And uh, we happen to brand them Yandex, um, but others may may choose a different strategy. Um, if I may, Daniel, I just want to go back to something that, that Yelena said because it, it, it triggered a funny memory. Uh, Yelena talked about uh, the unique entrepreneurial talent inside of Russia. And I think that the success of all these businesses at the end of the day is about the people that were allowed, that were able to recruit and retain. And uh, for the last, geez, you know, certainly since uh, 2012 and beyond, we've seen intense competition, intense recruiting inside Russia uh, for the technology talent that we have. And uh, we've been able to retain it because I think people are very proud of what they're able to do in this country. And, um, and they've had good companies to work for uh, where they can realize, can really realize their dreams. But it reminded me of a, of a conversation I had back in the early 90s. Um, I first came to Russia <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, 1983 as a student, and then uh, in 1990 to partner with Arkady Volish, starting a, uh, a computer distribution company. And my friends in Boston would say, geez, you know, these, these Russians, they, they had centuries under the czar, then they had 70 years of communism. Do you think they really have the capacity to be entrepreneurial? Do they really know what that means? And uh, I think that what we've seen is that the Russians are some of the most ambitious, effective, um, talented entrepreneurs anywhere in the world. And I think that that is an advantage that will remain, uh, it's, that's really kind of a durable type of advantage for the, for the economy. And I think that, um, that really that, that will continue to provide uh, strong growth for, for all these companies inside of Russia. And Thank you very much. And Oliver, Tinkoff, what are your thoughts about the sort of umbrella strategy, plugging and playing different, different companies within the Tinkoff ecosystem? Sure. So, <clears throat> I'll say something terrible, but we don't even have a brand strategy per se. So it's not like we, we say this has to be branded Tinkoff or this can be branded something else. Um, we have a strategy about the services that we want to have in our super app. Yeah? We have a strategy about the, the product verticals that we want to go in and build our own product line or business line, as we call them. Uh, we have a strategy as to how we drive engagement with customers. And we drive monthly active users, daily active users, uh, dwell time, and all the rest of it in our, in our interface. We have a strategy about interface development. 
So that, that's the, they're the things that we think about. We don't think about, you know, think of as a brand uh, that often. You know, okay, we do some TV, TV advertising, tons of performance, all the other good stuff. And obviously that's branded Tinkoff because that helps us to bring customers on board and there's uh, a, a certain benefit to having as much as possible under one brand because then you don't have to spend money developing rather inefficiently lots of different brands. But it's a, it's a viable strategy as well, uh, depending on what you want to do. So, so Mail has its own strategy, as you quite right, rightly pointed out. So the way we think about this is not about an umbrella brand or anything like that. It's, uh, it's what services do we want to have in our interface as many relevant digital services as possible in one place. What that interface looks like from a, a design UX is an aesthetic uh, perspective, um, navigability and all the other good stuff that goes into you know, interface design. Um, also, I'm talking about the mobile app in particular. Um, the, the single sign-on approach uh, where you have to have seamless switching between the different products and services within the ecosystem once you're in there, what drives additional benefits to customers so they're more loyal and consume more products and services in one place in your ecosystem, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How, how you deploy technology. So there are things we think about as opposed to getting hung up on a brand to go to you. So the brand's important. We have a brand. It's a great brand. We've invested a lot of money and effort into it. But, um, you know, when we're thinking about uh, our interface and who else we're putting in next, we partner with just about everybody in terms of digital services in Russia. We've got this long roadmap of adding more and more services in the super app over time. As you quite rightly pointed out, you can get your hair cut, hopefully not with the super app, because that could be a bit um, painful, I suspect. But through the super app, um, uh, we'll, the, we'll stick whoever makes sense in terms of other brands into our super app. That's fine as well. Yeah, so it's, it's a different paradigm of thinking to them. So it's not about one umbrella brand. Okay, it's a new world. And talking about new world, the final question, and this one is going to all our panelists. Um, what are you looking at in terms of the, the next mega trend? And I'll kick off there with uh, Svetlana at X5. Um, well, I think probably the biggest one is uh, conscious consumption. And uh, we uh, recently just had uh, you know, a panel together with Oliver on that. And uh, really think and, and talk about it a lot uh, in X5. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as part of our overall strategy, uh, you know, our strategy for um, uh, sustainable development, uh, we also just recently published our recommendations uh, for our suppliers. And uh, we really think that, uh, you know, by setting uh, the concrete goals uh, uh, to the management, uh, uh, by agreeing internally that uh, really uh, we are focusing not only on financial goals or not only on uh, customer metrics, but also on uh, sustainability, uh, we will um, really, you know, achieve the change. Uh, more importantly, we do see that, uh, uh, you know, this trend is developing uh, from our customers, uh, from consumers. And uh, we think uh, that uh, probably next uh, five, 10 years, uh, you know, this um, um, interest uh, in ECG from investors uh, really, uh, you know, interest, natural interest from our customers uh, and understanding within the company how to develop this uh, topic uh, will meet and uh, probably will change the environment a lot. Uh, and uh, the, the probably will change how the companies work. So we're really uh, focused on that. Uh, apart from, well, the reality for us on, uh, you know, omni-channel uh, performance uh, on client centricity, uh, this all stays. And I think uh, it will, uh, you know, remain uh, the core uh, of our strategy also. Thank you. Yelena, any thoughts? Yeah, it's a little bit difficult because I also had kind of the same. Uh, the, oh, the same trend. Great minds. Yeah, but uh, uh, I think first of all, kind of as Niels Bohr said, prediction is difficult, especially mm -hmm. about the future. Uh, so I think what um, what this COVID situation has shown us, it's uh, it's surprising uh, how easy it has been to switch to uh, essentially online distance working for pretty much uh, you know, all of the companies I know. And this is thanks to a lot of technologies that have been developed over the last whatever, couple of decades uh, from broad broadband infrastructure to various kind of software solutions or platforms for communications for both businesses and consumers. And so I think it, this, uh, this obviously is uh, something that would benefit from uh, and this will continue. Um, I think just to kind of echo and say a little bit different what Svetlana said that the trend that we're seeing is more 
um, kind of uh, it's more focused and responsible consumption. And uh, what we have seen, uh, I will you know, give a couple of examples of our portfolio companies. One is uh, Fkusville, uh, where everything is private label. And you go there and kind of you think about the insatiable uh, Russian consumer that wants choice all the time. And you come to Fkusville shop and there's no choice. You know, there is one, uh, uh, there's one yogurt and there's one milk uh, and, uh, and, and that's it. And kind of you get all private label. And it's been extremely successful for the, with the customers because uh, they value somebody has uh, has done the work for them uh, in selecting the best product, and so it saves them time. And uh, so that's kind of it's been probably one specific example. It's not about kind of I don't think that the customers think about sustainable environment, at least not most of them, uh, but they think about their own time and they think about kind of. Uh, uh, how to optimize not just the money, but also kind of their time and the quality of life. And uh, I think the COVID situation has stressed this uh, even more. So we have uh, another company that we recently invested in called Synergetic. This is uh, eco-friendly household chemicals, a uh, you know, local brand, extremely successful. And uh, uh, we never expected that something like this would be so successful, but the customers are very much <laughs> focused on high polygenic products, that products that are good both for them, but also for the environment. And I think that's definitely the trend. It's much less uh, kind of impulse buying lots of stuff, but much more kind of what do I want and how, I, mm -hmm. how do I solve my specific problem. And I think this kind of sustainable, all of the environmental uh, problems, I think it's a little bit kind of uh, corollary of what the customer's behavior is uh, is changing towards. So that's what we're focused on. And I'm thinking about more targeted and more kind of uh, uh, specifically focused oriented consumption, hopefully less of it. <coughs> Thanks, Elena. And uh, Oliver, you, I, I hear last night that you were named European Retail Bank of the Year. So congratulations for that. Now you've got that under your belt. Um, what's the next mega trend? Thanks very much, yeah. Um, so, Maybe actually picking up on some of the themes uh, from uh, mentioned by Elena and uh, Svetlana. Um, basically, <laughs> let's say, let's face it: financial services and banking, even if it's nice digital banking, yeah, doesn't really get the endorphins flowing in most people. Yeah? Um, uh, so we're working on uh, the next generation of interaction with the mobile app. So the mobile app is pretty, um, you know, obviously. Uh, uh, ubiquitous now, this, this, it's not, everybody understands it. it's not rocket science, but it, most people have a, a fairly decent uh, offering in, in Russia these days at least. But it's, it's difficult to do a really good mobile app. But to do an extremely good mobile app um, in terms of deploying all sorts of technological capabilities around and inside Tinkoff now is even more difficult. So we're working on, on what we think is going to be the start of the next, uh, the next big trend, which is what we call AI banking. Yeah, so that sounds like some marketing gimmickry, uh, gimmickry. What does it actually mean? So it means that you're optimizing customers' time, as Elena was saying, yeah, on the one hand. So you've got your, what we call hygiene transactions. You've got your regular payments, paying the school bill, topping up your mobile phone, I don't know, a traffic fine or whatever. You take them into the background, you automate them, and you take the headache away from the customer because the customers are only spending their precious time on that. And it definitely doesn't produce endorphins. <laughs> What does produce endorphins is enjoyable stuff. It's selecting a holiday. Uh, it's um, maybe doing some shopping, obviously responsible uh, uh, purchasing behavior uh, without too much uh, consumer excess. It's, um, it's uh, entertainment. Um, and so when you have a huge customer base with tons of transactional data and behavioral data, you can start using that to generate insights on a kind of lookalike basis, yeah? So people like you, so it's the, the recommendation approach or based on machine learning, uh, customizing uh, uh, and, and driving relevancy of offers to, to customers. So they get the benefits of getting extra uh, points, uh, cashbacks, whatever it might be. So you're getting rewarded for being uh, a loyal member of a particular ecosystem uh, on the one hand, and we can drive a lot of that in a very targeted way based on your behavioral profile. And at the same time, we're offering, um, we're making suggestions as to how to, uh, I don't know, save well, invest uh, more efficiently, um, um, purchase better, manage your money better, manage your time better. I'm, I'm 
providing content in terms of uh, the things that you can be doing that we know you like. Um, and um, it's easy to say, I've just said it in a couple of minutes, but to do it is actually very difficult, uh, especially when it's in a, in a small screen, which is your mobile app. Um, uh, but this is where we're going, and we think this is going to be you know, a big trend of, of uh, financial service provision over the next five years or so. Sounds great. Look forward to seeing it. And finally, John. Um, thank you. Um, first, I just want to note how, how few mentions there have been of COVID during this conference. Uh, which says to me, uh, we're all optimistic that as a, as a world, we're going to move through this crisis and we'll kind of get back onto a more normal footing at some point, which I think is good news. Uh, I happen to be optimistic about that myself. Um, I would uh, echo what Svetlana and Yelena began to touch on in terms of ESG. I think that's going to be a huge trend. Uh, so I won't repeat that, but I will uh, focus on something that I think is um, going to be as big, uh, perhaps less exciting to, to, to mention because it's not new, but I think that uh, we will continue to see a movement from offline to online. We will continue to see um, an, an acceleration of digitization. I think all of this is going to happen within the context of ecosystems. Uh, so I think this is one area where size really does matter. And uh, I think that we will see uh, the large companies you know, continue to have, uh, have advantages here as they can address uh, more opportunities across their consumer base. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for, for small companies either, because it means that companies will, the startups and the innovators will be able to tie into these large ecosystems and scale much more rapidly than they could before. So I think the opportunity really uh, exists for, for small companies to grow faster, for big companies to get bigger. And I think that the outlook for uh, everyone who's uh, connected and who's able to bring together online and offline is actually uh, very bright. And uh, we're going to see a lot of exciting things happen in the years to come. Thank you very much, John. And with that, I'm very sorry to say that our allotted hour is up. Um, so I'd very much like to thank all of our panelists today, Svetlana, Yelena, Oliver and John. It's really been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all so much for committing your time to this today. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of Renaissance Capital. Um, and we're looking forward next year to seeing you in person because we're committed to bringing our conference back into the offline world, just as anyone, everyone else goes back and um, commits to the online world. So thank you very much indeed. This actually concludes um, our public panel sessions, but the one-on-one -on -one meetings will continue tomorrow um, and the recording of this event will be available on the conference webpage, which is moscow2020.rencap.com, as well as on our, our YouTube channel. So again, thank you very much for all the participants today. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Бизнес – это риски. Выявлять риски и эффективно управлять ими помогают решения Интерфакса. Создавая эти сервисы, мы опираемся на наш опыт работы с информацией, знание потребностей клиентов и качественный контент. IT-решения Интерфакса преобразуют информацию в знания. Они помогают нашим клиентам вовремя принимать решения, снижать риски и расширять деловые связи. Интерфакс – IT-системы для бизнеса.